In this video, we're going to talk about the uh, definition of continuity of functions of a complex variable. So uh, to start off, let's recall the definition of what is a limit of, what's the definition of a limit for functions of a complex variable? And so I just made a video about this. You should check it out before this video. So here's the definition. For G, that's some subset of the complex plane. And for W, that is an element of G. And for a function F, whose domain is G, and let's let L just be some complex number. Then to say that L is equal to the limit as Z approaches W of F of Z, what's that mean? That means the following. So I'm gonna give you the epsilon delta definition here. So given epsilon greater than zero, epsilon some positive real number, there exists some positive real number delta such that if the absolute value of Z minus W is between zero and delta, remember that just says that Z and W are at most distance delta from each other, and then the zero on the left side says that I'm not allowing z to actually be equal to w. So I only care about points that are very close to w, not actually equal to w. Anyway, so if z is sufficiently close to w, then f of z is really, really close to l. And let me give you, again, like a schematic of what is this definition trying to capture here. So here's our setup. I've got my domain g on the left, and then I plug points inside of g into f, and it spits out numbers over on the right side, and l is just some complex number. So I'm not necessarily saying l is an output of g. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. That's not a requirement in the definition here. So what's going on in this definition? This definition says that I should be able to put any ball or disk or window or neighborhood, whatever word you like to use, around l of whatever radius epsilon I like, any positive real number. And once I do that though, once one is put around it, then I should be able to go back and look at W and find some disk to put around W of radius delta. So already you've kind of, I'm trying to emphasize here that that delta, the blue window, it depends on how big the red window was. And that's the relationship. The blue window depends on how big the red window was. So I should be able to find some disk to put around W such that if I take any point inside of that blue disk, Z, then its output f of z should be inside of that red disk. And again, I wanna emphasize here that I'm not requiring that L is what you get when you plug in w into your function, right? L does not have to be the output of your function at that point w that you're interested in. And so here's an example. So if f of z is this function z times z plus one all divided by z, and I care about the point w equals zero, if I take the limit as z approaches zero of this function, of course you could cancel those z's. And I get that the limit as z approaches zero, uh, this would be the same thing as the limit of z approaches zero as z plus one. And when I plug zero into that, I get one. So remember like the limit doesn't care about like holes, right? That's kind of what I'm getting at from like a calculus one point of view. What am I trying to uh, emphasize here though? F of zero is not one, right? I can't plug zero into the original function, right? It's undefined there. So my point here is that I had a limit L, but it's not the output of my function at the point I'm interested in. So sometimes, you know, for some functions, it is the case. And so what if L is the output of the function at the point W that you're interested in? That's when we say that L, that the function F, sorry, is continuous at that point W. So again, continuity is some kind of an adjective to say that limits work in a really pretty way. So let's actually write that down in kind of a formal definition. What's the definition of uh, continuity of complex value functions or com functions of a complex variable? So let's again, take G to be some subset of the complex plane. W is somebody in that domain. And F is a function whose domain is G. We're gonna say F is continuous at this number W, this complex number W, if given some positive number epsilon, there exists a positive number delta, such that, again, if z is sufficiently close to w, if it's in within delta of w, and notice here I'm allowing the case that z equals w. That's cool, fine. Because I know ahead of time for continuity, I want to be able to plug in that point w. So that's why I'm saying it's okay if z actually is equal to w. That's why the zero is not here here. Anyway though, so far it should seem an awful lot like the definition of a limit here, because it is. All the changes is right here. As long as z is within delta of w, then f of z is within epsilon of of w. All I've done is just made a little switcheroo. Instead of L, where L doesn't have to be an output, for continuity, what L has to be is f of w. Let's look at a picture. And again, in my schematic, here's my setup. And I know f of w exists if I'm talking about continuity. It makes sense to plug w in. Otherwise, you wouldn't be talking about continuity. And what are we doing? As long as you put, it, so I'm sorry, if you put any window around, any disk around f of w, of radius epsilon, you should be able to find some disk to put around W of radius delta, so that if you take any point inside of that blue disk, its output should be sent inside of the red disk. 
But what are some things that we should maybe write down about this or to notice about it, some notes? If f is continuous for every single point in the domain of the function, then we're gonna say that f's continuous on that domain. So we're kind of generalizing. The definition above with epsilons and deltas was talking about what's it mean to be continuous at a point. And then here in my note, I'm telling you what's it mean for a function to be continuous on a set. We're just saying it's continuous on this set if it's continuous at each member in the set. And in this case, for continuity, on a set, if to say f's continuous on g, in that case, delta itself, I know in my pictures that I've tried to, to emphasize that delta can depend on epsilon, it's also allowed to depend on the w that you're considering. So in other words, epsilon and w, they might both be used when you're trying to calculate delta. Now, if delta only depended on epsilon, in other words, delta would work no matter what w you cared about, delta only depends on epsilon. In that case, you'd say that f is uniformly continuous on the set g. And there might be another video about that at some point in the future. But for right now, we're just considering the case of uh, what's it mean for a function to be continuous at a point or on a set, uh, not uniformly continuous necessarily. So let's look at an example that demonstrates the definition. Let's do one that's a little bit non-trivial anyway. So what if my function f of z is z squared, and I want to show that it's continuous on the disk centered at 0 of radius 1. So remember, that's the notation that I'm using in these videos just to note, think about the unit circle, but just not the boundary of it. So how I like to start these epsilon delta things is always with some scratch work. So let epsilon be bigger than 0, and let's let w be, really I should say w is not an element of just the complex numbers in general. It should be an element inside of my disk centered at 0 of radius 1. So that's a typo on my part. Just bear with me there. And what we're going to do is we're going to think about what if I put a little disk around f of w of radius epsilon. And what I know that I need to do is I need to find some number delta, some positive real number delta, such that if z is a member of the disk centered at w of that radius delta, then f of z, its output, lands inside my disk centered at f of w of radius epsilon. And maybe that's a lot of notation to track. Let's maybe try to look at a picture over here. So here's the setup. And at the bottom, you know, I kind of give you the punchline. Again, what are we going for here? But if you pay attention to the picture and watch what I'm going to do in a second, I'm really just going to go over uh, the definition of continuity and limits again. So again, on the left, I'm starting with, I'm thinking about w being inside the domain of my function. And so I've drawn for you the disk centered at 0 of radius 1. So if I pick any w in there, and I'm going to consider its output, f of w, who knows where it is over in the complex plane. But what should we be able to do? If I take any disk centered at f of w, so again, that's the d f w comma epsilon, if you're trying to track that notation, that's just shorthand for it. If I put any window around f of w of radius epsilon, I should be able to go back to the domain and find some small enough window to put around w of radius delta. So that if I pick any point z inside of that little blue window, if you want me to zoom in a little bit, if I pick any point z inside of that little blue window, I'm guaranteed its output f of z lands inside of the red window. So again, that's what we're going to try to do here. That's our intuition. And so how do you do this with algebra? And maybe, oh, sorry, I jumped the gun. Before I do some algebra, remember, delta can depend on epsilon and w. But in particular here, it's not allowed to depend on z. And if you, if you rewind and watch how I did that with the picture again, notice I had delta in place already, and z has to be inside of that delta window, right? So that's trying to say that z depends, where z is, depends on delta. So that's what I mean here. Uh, delta does not depend on z. It's the other way around. z depends on delta. Z is inside that delta window. All right, so then what do we typically do, though, with these? We typically always play with f of z minus f of w. And so let's see what that is. So I know what f does. It just squares the input. So I get z squared minus w squared. And I do some algebra. I factor that as a difference of squares. And I see z minus w, its absolute value. At some point, I know that I want that to be less than delta. And so uh, maybe what we'll do is uh, we'll do some more algebra there. But I'm going to leave that z minus w on its own. And it'd be really cool if I could get another one of those in the picture somehow, perhaps. And what we need to do then is to, to play around with that absolute value of z plus w. And so one way you might do that is to do our favorite trick as a mathematician, which is to add 0 in a sneaky way. So I've just added and subtracted w. So in other words, I've added 0 inside of there. And the reason I've done that is because I'm going to put the two positive w's together. So you'll, you're going to expect a 2w in a moment. And then I'm going to put the z minus w next to each other there. 
So all I've done is I've just rearranged that second absolute value term. And the reason I've done that then though, is that now I can use the triangle inequality to split up that second absolute value. I know that the absolute value of z minus w plus 2w should be less than or equal to the absolute value of z minus w plus the absolute value of 2w. And that's what I'm doing right here. So this you've noticed, I hope that you notice, now there's an inequality here that's less than or equal to the following. And again, all I did from here to here is the triangle inequality. And the reason that I've done that then is that now uh, I've got, this is gonna be depending on, I can make that smaller than delta, this is gonna be smaller than delta, and then this is just w. So what I've done is I've done a bunch of algebra so that the right-hand side doesn't depend on z at all. It's gonna depend only on deltas and w's. And that's what I want. Again, up here in yellow, I'm trying to say, I only want the right-hand side to depend on uh, epsilons and w's here. And of course, when I get deltas in the picture, you'll see how epsilon comes in in a minute. All right, so then so far I'm gonna say, all right, I, eventually I know that I'm gonna be able to say that's less than delta times delta plus two absolute value of W. So here's the game, how do I relate that back? We win the game if we just set that expression to be epsilon, right? You can imagine you're going through this epsilon delta proof and I just want this at the very end to be less than epsilon. It would be cool if these were equal. So in other words, we just did a bunch of algebra to try to set up a little equation to solve. So we're gonna solve this equation uh, for delta. So let's do that. So you get this quadratic equation, delta squared plus two absolute value of uh, w times delta, and then I just moved epsilon over to the left side equals zero. Do the quadratic formula on that. You only really care about the, you know, technically quadratic formula, you get plus or minus squared, blah, blah, blah. You only want the plus one in this case, because you know delta's gotta be a positive real number. And of course here, you could divide everything by two, and I'm gonna do that in the next, uh, the next few steps. But here what I want you to notice, Delta equals a bunch of stuff that only depends on W's and epsilons, and that's good, right? In particular, right here is maybe where I want to emphasize. I don't see any Z's there at all. So delta is allowed to only depend on what's the point I care about and what epsilon is. So now let's try to just run our proof. So how's the proof go? A lot of the time it's just running your scratch work kind of backwards or maybe following your scratch work a little bit. So how does any continuity proof or epsilon delta proof go? You always start with let epsilon be bigger than zero. And let's let w, again, not just be any complex number. I meant to say it should be an element of d01, because I know that's the domain of the function that I'm considering. So I'm going to type on my point. And now let's choose delta to be, again, this is where I've simplified the above expression in red. I've just divided everything by two. Right? You can factor a two out from the square root and then cancel at the bottom. So I get minus absolute value of w plus square root of absolute value w squared plus epsilon. So if z is any point that is inside the disk centered at w of radius delta, in other words, if z is that close to w, then f of z minus f of w and absolute value, how far apart those two complex numbers are. And I'm just gonna go through my scratch work. That is the same thing as z squared minus w squared. I do the factoring. I add zero in a sneaky way and split it up with a uh, triangle inequality like you saw me do above. I'm just skipping the step there and going straight to the punchline. And then now what do I know? I know that, uh, let me try to highlight it here. I'm assuming Z is within delta of W. In other words, that says that I know that the absolute value of Z minus W is less than delta. So these two expressions here, I can substitute those out for some deltas. So I know that this expression altogether should be less than delta times delta plus two absolute value of w. And now what I'm gonna actually do is I'm going to substitute, what do I know delta is? I know delta is this expression here. So if I substitute that in for all the deltas that I see, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna foil that out. Cause again, the end of this proof should be, you know, less than say epsilon if you wanna make it pretty. And so if you foil that out now, Here's what you get when the dust settles. And let me zoom in a little bit. You can check me if you like. So I encourage you to foil that out. Check my college algebra there. But when all the dust settles, I think I see some stuff starts to cancel. I see that these two things cancel out. I got a plus and a minus. Uh, what else do I see start to cancel? I see here is one of these and one of these, but then minus two of those, so they're gone. So wait a minute, if I keep track of everybody that's, uh, everybody canceled except one person. One person, epsilon. Paul Erdős would be proud I'm calling epsilon a person. So at the end of the day, I get that f of z minus f of w is less than epsilon. And of course, that's the punchline. We win the game. So we just show that f of z is continuous for any point that's inside the disk centered at zero of radius one.